All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, first of all, good morning and welcome. My name is Taylor Wood and I'm the Associate Dean of Development for the School of Medicine Basic Sciences at Vanderbilt University. I'll be serving as your moderator today. First, I wanna thank you all for attending. We're thrilled to have you with us today for this exciting presentation. One item of housekeeping, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please type them there. I'll be watching throughout uh, and monitoring those. Once we reach the end of the presentation, we'll do our best to provide the answers for them. Now, I'm here to introduce Dr. Larry Marnett, Dean of Basic Sciences at the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Marnett is also professor, director of the A.B. Hancock Jr. Memorial Laboratory for Cancer Research, Mary Geddes Stallman, Professor of Cancer Research, and a professor of biochemistry chemistry and pharmacology. He's been at Vanderbilt since 1989 and Dean of the School since its creation in 2016. Now I'll turn it over to you, Larry. Thank you, Taylor, and welcome to you all to today's presentation by Steve Fessick. As Taylor said, I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences, which was an entity that didn't exist when many of you were at Vanderbilt. It was created four years ago as part of the VU VUMC reorganization. We're comprised of four departments, each of which was founded around 1925, along with eight centers and a number of outstanding research core facilities. We also have one of the best PhD training programs in biomedical sciences in the United States. School of Medicine Basic Sciences has roughly the same number of faculty as the School of Engineering and Peabody College. We're an extremely research active school and have the second largest budget in the university with approximately 60% of our funding coming from research grants. Our faculty are dedicated to fundamental discovery science, trying to understand how biological systems work and how they go wrong in disease. A unique aspect of our school is that we have truly exceptional facilities for taking our discoveries from the bench into the clinic. We have great strengths in neuroscience and cancer drug discovery, but apply our technologies to many other clinical problems as well. Today, you'll hear a presentation by Steve Fessick, the head of our cancer drug discovery program, who has done a very recent pivot to attack the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Steve obtained his PhD in medicinal chemistry from the University of Connecticut and was a postdoctoral associate at Yale University in the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, where he learned about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, abbreviated NMR. After his postdoctoral work, he joined Abbott Laboratories, where he developed several new NMR methods and used them to determine the structures of disease-related proteins and to discover drugs. Steve developed a highly innovative method called fragment-based discovery that enabled pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs against targets previously considered undruggable. Steve eventually became divisional vice president for cancer research at Abbott. He led efforts that resulted in the introduction of multiple drugs onto the market for cancer and HIV AIDS. He'll tell you about them during his lecture. We recruited Steve to Vanderbilt in 2010 as Orrin Ingram Professor of Cancer Research and Professor of Biochemistry. He has built a world-class program in cancer drug discovery and has multiple candidate drugs in clinical trials for solid tumors and bloodborne cancers. In May of this year, he initiated efforts to develop drugs for the treatment of COVID-19 that would kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus responsible for the disease. He has made remarkable progress in a relatively short period of time, and we're excited to have him tell you about it today. Steve? Well, thank you, Larry, and um, thank all of you for attending uh, this talk. Um, as Larry said, I'm going to tell you about our efforts to target coronaviruses, not only this one, but future as well. Um, now, you all are familiar with coronaviruses. That's all you hear about on the news. It's had a devastating impact on our health, especially those that are compromised with respiratory problems and immunocompromised patients. 
uh, it also has a devastating impact on our economy. Um, people are without jobs. Um, they have to, the government has to supply them money to stay afloat. And we're really not going to see the end of that economic impact for some time. Um, and also has an effect on our freedom. I can't go to any restaurant I want to. I can't go to the beach. Uh, it wasn't too long ago. I can't do a lot of things. My freedom is compromised. I have to wear a mask everywhere I go. But the worst might be yet to come. The possible future impact of coronaviruses could be worse. If a virus comes about that is more deadly than this coronavirus, um, we're in really big trouble. It could have a bigger economic effect um, and even give us less freedom where we're tied to our homes and have to stay there. Um, so I said, let's, can we do something about this? Um, next slide. Oh, I changed it. Um, so there are various approaches uh, we could use for stopping the coronavirus. We could use antibodies, develop antibodies, vaccines, and indeed these may work and I hope they do. But I, um, the vaccines, I'll uh, remind you, were not effective against HIV. Um, they uh, didn't work. And even the flu vaccines, we have to develop new ones all the time to uh, counteract the strain, new strains that are appearing. Um, my expertise is around small molecule drug discovery. And there are many examples of small molecules that are developed and some of the advantages are potential for oral activity unlike the antibodies and vaccines they're cheaper to make and they uh, can be effective against many different proteins a single mutation might not affect uh, the small molecule drugs that we develop Next slide. Oops. Um, hey, so, Steve. Yeah. Steve, could you hold on one sec? Uh, I'm getting a few people saying that the, the slides are not advancing. Um, so I was wondering if it, if it might be possible for, uh, let's see, Aaron, I believe, is going to start sharing them, and then he can advance them for you. Um, oh. So if that fixed the issue for people, uh, if, if you could just let me know via the, the Q&A. OK. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about today is, first of all, give you a primer on what's the, what does it take to discover small molecule drugs. Then I'm going to tell you about the particular methods that we use, fragment-based methods and structure-based design. I'll give you examples of how we use these powerful techniques to develop cancer drugs, my screen just went off. And then I'll uh, tell you about the targets we've chosen uh, for the coronavirus, tell you about the status of our efforts and the future plans. Next slide. Now this represents the overall process of drug discovery. First, you identify a target based on the biology and validate this target the best we can. The next step is to generate a lead that um, a starting point at which we can uh, start the whole program and then optimize these leads, not only for binding to the target, but um, other criteria uh, that gets to the site of action, et cetera, et cetera. Then, uh, after the preclinical work, we test them in clinical trials. And then, if we're lucky, 
that goes to market. Next slide. Now, our particular expertise lends itself to rapidly going after a lead and getting that lead optimized. Next slide. The particular method that I talk about that Larry alluded to is fragment-based methods. And for this, instead of using a large molecule as a lead, we um, screen a bunch of smaller molecules uh, using a technique called NMR. And we do so because it's highly sensitive um, and the small molecules don't bind that tightly. Um, and what we do, as shown in the middle, NMR spectra, we record these 2D um, experiments. And this is actually two spectra on top of one another. The green spectrum represents without added compound, and the white is when we added a compound. Note that some of those signals shift or change their location. That indicates uh, that the compound is binding. And what's more, it tells you approximately where they bind based on which signals change. And once we identify a compound shown on the right that binds to the protein, we then try to optimize it using structure-based design, filling the pockets, and then identify a compound nearby. And when we do so, we get the three-dimensional structure of these components when bound, telling us, showing us how to link them together. And that's shown on the bottom. And we can rapidly go using this method um, getting hits and optimize them in short order. Next slide. Now I'm going to show you just what structure-based design is. An example of this is when we ran an NMR-based screen, identified a molecule that bound to the pocket shown. Um, now we have to optimize it. Well, how do we optimize this? Next slide. We look at filling the pockets. So in this example, S7 was filled with that aromatic group shown on the right, and S4 was filled, shown, filling up that pocket. This is how we do structure-based design. Next slide. Now, how do we apply it? When I was at Abbott, we had a problem. We were trying to um, inhibit this protein. This protein called BCL2 and its family members ki kept cancer cells apparently alive by making more of it. And it inhibited our ability to kill off these cancer cells. So what we did is we ran a fragment-based screen and we identified the two molecules shown in the center for binding to the, the, this family of proteins. And then we, based on the structure, linked them together um, and with that linked molecule, optimize it using structure-based design and medicinal chemistry uh, procedures ultimately leading to ABT199, which is venetoclax, now known as that. It is approved for the treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia and also acute my myeloid leukemia, AML. Um, and it promises to be even further used in cancer. There are other trials currently running with this uh, molecule. Next slide. Now, another example here within our own uh, Vanderbilt is MCL1. MCL1 is a member of the same family of proteins that keeps cancers alive 
Well, we wanted to inhibit MCL1. And how we did so is, again, running the screen and identifying the two molecules shown. They bind to slightly different uh, pockets in MCL1 and shown then we could uh, merge them together to make a merged compound. Now the compound shown in the middle, we then obtained an X-ray crystal structure of it when bound to MCL1. And we saw that the two um, parts of the molecule are close to one another in space. And what we did is just cyclize it. Another example of structure-based design, and we ended up with a molecule that was really potent. Uh, next slide. Just to show you, we ended up with a 16 million fold improvement in binding in short order. Um, this is the kind of results you can get with this method methodology. Next slide. Now, the MCL1 inhibitor can melt tumors after a single dose. We partnered with Berger Ingelheim and they're taking this through into the clinic and on uh, to run the clinical trials. But it's really promising uh, our MCL1 inhibitor, both uh, mainly for heme malignancies, but also various solid tumors alone and when, com uh, when given with other drugs used to treat the disease. Next slide. We have many other examples at Vanderbilt where we've used this methodology. Um, the two top programs for SAS and KRAS, for example, are partnered also with Berger Ingelheim out of Austria. And these affect the RAS pathway one of the holy grails in cancer research. Um, and RAS is important because it's mutated in about 30% overall cancers. Pancreatic cancer, 90% have an activating RAS mutation. Lung and colon, about 50, 40%. So we're trying to develop drugs in this pathway and are successful at um, defining drugs that bind to the pocket in KRAS and SAWS. We also have a program, uh, WDL5, we're working on now. And in fact, the example I showed you about the million, 16 million fold improvement and other uh, examples of the type of um, work that we do. Um, with WDL5, we're seeing a remarkable improvement over the hits that we obtained from the NMR-based screen uh, through the optimization, and we're close to declaring a cl clinical candidate for this against this protein, which would be useful in blood cancers. Colon cancer is dictated by Wnt. We have started this, and we also have a program to make less uh, toxic cancer drugs. Again, this method is really powerful. And so um, I started thinking, could we apply this to um, antivirals? Next slide. Well, to show you which target we applied it to, I have to take you through um, an abbreviated version of the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. So the first thing the virus has to do, it has to enter mammalian cells. The reason is it doesn't have all the machinery it needs. It has to use mammalian cell machinery to replicate itself and to uh, carry out a lot of function. So the first step is it, it, its outer proteins uh, namely, the spike protein must interact with the receptor on the surface of the mammalian cell. Next slide. That causes um, the virus to enter the cell and 
uh, basically release its genetic material shown in green. Next slide. So now it has to hijack the ribosomes represented by that looks like a shoe, I guess, um, a large lobe and a small lobe. And um, it provides the information it needs to translate that information into a polypeptide or protein shown in red. Now, upon forming the uh, polypeptide, um, it's not functional and nothing could go on um, because that protein is one long polypeptide. Next slide. It must be chopped up into smaller proteins that are now functional. And this is accomplished by two enzymes, the papain-like protease and the main protease is responsible for chopping up the protein that comes out. Next slide. Then what happens is that genetic material is copied. So you have a lot of that genetic material in the cell. And next slide. Now, what happens is the proteins that are chopped up by the two proteases are used to replicate the RNA um, and without it, you wouldn't get this, and also serve to make up and encapsulate the uh, RNA into uh, what looks like a virus. Next slide. And then the virus is released by exocytosis, in, and then you have it so it continues. The virus then goes on and affects other mammalian cells, and that's how the process works. Now, in considering what could we target with a small molecule, we could target many aspects. First, entry into the virus, uh, into the mammalian cell, and blocking that interaction of the spike protein with this receptor. We could um, bind to the proteins involved in replicating the RNA, the, um, the red, for example, protein, and uh, affect uh, that protein. What we chose to do, next slide, is to block the two proteases. Next, back one, back one, is to block the two proteases, the papain-like protease and the main protease. If we did so, we wouldn't have functional protein, so we couldn't replicate the RNA. Also, we couldn't form a virus. What would be left with, next slide, is a long polypeptide that's not functional and the virus could not reproduce. We would stop the maturation of the virus. This is analogous to what occurred in HIV. By inhibiting the HIV protease, which is responsible for maturation of the virus, um, we stopped the virus in its tracks. And when I was at Abbott, we did so develop an inhibitor for HIV protease, and that was really the death knoll for HIV. Uh, next slide. So let me tell you a little more about these proteases of SARS-CoV-2. The papain-like protease shown in the ribbon diagram is a fairly large protein. And you can see that it must chop up a peptide, then the peptide is located where the green uh, circles are, and that's what the active site is for this protease. And blown up now in a space filling model, and you can see all the pockets we can have access to and use our magic. Next slide. But first, we cloned, expressed, and purified and labeled 
um, the PL protease. And you can see there, it gives a good NMR spectrum. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to test if any of the molecules we have bind to the PL protease. Next slide. And what you can see here is uh, two spectra. There's a blue one without adding anything as a reference spectrum, and the red one, which shows a movement of some of the peaks. And what we added was that compound shown in the upper left, indicating that that compound um, binds to uh, PL protease. And what's more, uh, we could tell where approximately it's binding. Next slide. So what about the main protease? If we had any luck there? Well, the main protease is a dimer. That is two proteins sticking together. And shown in blue is a monomer. And shown in gray on the right is a monomer. Now where its active site is, or where the peptide binds and uh, must get chopped up is shown uh, in green. And you can see again in a blow up the pockets that we have op access to and we can do our magic. Next slide. Well, we've cloned, expressed, purified, and labeled the main protease. And this is what its NMR spectrum looks like. And now we do the same thing. We run our screen and we look for things that bind to the main protease. Next slide. And shown here is in uh, two NMR spectra, the reference spectrum in blue and in red when we added that compound shown on the upper left. And you can see when we add that compound, uh, we get binding um, because we see a shift in some of these signals. So we've already uh, identified two molecules, one molecule and others as well, that bind to the papain-like protease and the main protease. Next slide. So the next steps are to obtain a crystal structure of these compounds when bound to these proteins. And using structure-based design, we want to improve these inhibitors by accessing or binding to additional pockets, we, which we can see using X-ray crystal structures. Next slide. So what is the progress that we made in the short period that we began this program? We've cloned, expressed, and purified both target proteases. And we've conducted, we're conducting fragment-based screens, and we've already identified hits for both proteases. And we're determining the crystal structures when bound in order to guide our um, modifications. And then, in addition, we are going to um, develop, we've developed cleavage assays for both proteases. This would allow us to measure how good one inhibitor is versus another. And we've developed these assays for both of the proteases. And the optimization process has already started. We've ordered compounds, we've made compounds, to fit these pockets on these proteases. Next slide. So having done this, and what do we expect to achieve from our work? Well, we expect that we will find potent inhibitors of both SARS-CoV-2 proteases, the papain like protease and the main protease. These two proteins, proteases, are absolutely required for um, the life cycle of the virus, as I showed you. And we think we can develop 
uh, protease inhibitors for both of them. And what this will result in is stopping, if it hasn't already, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, furthermore, what this achievement will be, will uh, solve is future coronaviruses. You see, coronaviruses are very similar, and especially the proteases. They're very similar in the structure of them. And so a small molecule that inhibits one is likely to inhibit the other. So the compounds that we um, identify um, will likely stop future pandemics. And this is critical uh, to not have to go through what we just went through with COVID-19 to stop the pandemic or the future right in its tracks um, early on and not let it get to this state. Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. I'd just like to take a moment to point out that this, this project started from ground zero in early May. So what you've seen today went from a kind of a dead start to uh, real significant progress in about six weeks. So this is really remarkable. Um, I want to turn it over to Taylor Wood, who's going to lead the question and answer period. Taylor? Thank you, Larry. If you guys have any other questions, uh, feel free to pop them up in the Q&A. We have a number that have come in already. Um, so I will start with one that I, I think is pretty interesting. Uh, Steve, your expertise is mostly in, in cancer drugs. Uh, what did, made you decide to, to change your focus to viral, in particular COVID-19? Interesting question. Um, you know, like many of you, like all of you, I was in quarantine and I saw the devastating effects that the virus had. Um, I couldn't go out, I couldn't do anything. Um, a lot of my friends lost their business or lost their jobs. And I said, wait a second, I can do something about this. Um, we have methodology in hand, we have a really good lab that's used to applying these methods to cancer uh, targets. And the viral targets are actually easier to target. They're enzymes. And um, I have experience, we, I was involved in the, um, discovering the HIV protease drugs when I was at Abbott and also I worked on so SARS-CoV back in 2003. So I felt like, and so I started reading on the possible targets, everything I could get my hands on, uh, and eventually started this program. Uh, and uh, this is where we are today, remarkable progress uh, for targeting the proteases of SARS-CoV-2. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, another question is maybe if you could go over again how, how those small molecules inhibit uh, the viral spread and then maybe elaborate on what the advantage of small molecules are versus vaccines and, and neutralize or neutralizing antibodies. Well, small molecules are advantageous um, because First of all, you can apply, you can take a pill um, and that's good enough. Um, another thing is the proteases uh, of different coronaviruses are very similar. So that once you inhibit one, you can inhibit other proteases and stop the virus. Um, the vaccines, uh, are expensive to make, and when you finally get them, they're not that they're not good for uh, all coronaviruses. So I see an advantage that way. Plus, they can't be given orally. 
Um, so for all these reasons, I think, um, at least I'm biased, but small molecules really have an advantage. But let me say that just because, like we could have targeted another part with small molecules or antibodies, and what really works with viruses, because viruses can mutate rapidly and change, even the proteases. So what really works is not only you have one drug, but you have multiple drugs against the same um, virus. And that's what really worked against HIV. We had um, drugs that inhibited many aspects of the life cycle. Great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Uh, a lot of questions coming through about what the next steps are, what's the timeline for this, how much uh, is it going to cost? Maybe you could elaborate on, on what you see happening in the future with this particular research. Well, as I said, one of the advantages that we have is being able to rapidly develop um, potent inhibitors of uh, these proteases um, using this methodology. And we've shown this many times over in the cancer targets that I told you about. And um, so I think that we should be able to get a potent inhibitor in as little as one year. And now for the um, approval of a drug of a molecule like that to be given to patients, a lot of it depends on governmental uh, approval. That is, are they gonna fast, fast track the approval? Um, well, if we still have the epidemic, they'll fast track this in clinical trials um, to really see the approval as fast as they can get it. Um, so I can see that, but moreover, the molecules we develop that inhibit this coronavirus are likely to work in future coronaviruses, as I said. And that's a really important concept. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, one other question here, what, what's the origin of these molecules? How are you creating them and then using them in testing with the NMR? Well, first of all, when I first came to Vanderbilt, I built um, arguably one of the best fragment libraries uh, in the world. Um, and th that's where we get our start to everything. So I wanted to make sure that it was the best. And we had to go, took two years to develop this library. That's where we get the origin of all our studies, we find a hit or a starting point uh, for all the other lead optimization. So um, that's we, where it gets its start, and then we can optimize rapidly using the structure of co-complexes. Steve, how big is that library? That library is one of the largest uh, around is uh, our library is about uh, 14,000 molecules. Thanks. Typical fragment libraries are 2,000 or something like that. Do you, when you're looking in those libraries, are there any selectivity concerns about uh, the inhibitors that may lead to toxi toxicity in humans? The, in cancer, uh, toxicity is a major concern because the proteins that we're targeting are human proteins. They're, they're the same proteins that carry out important functions in your body. The uh, proteins that we're targeting here are viral proteins, so we're less likely to get toxicity from uh, our molecules because they attack viral proteins and we will know 
whether or not we see off-target toxicity when we test them in animals. Do they inhibit other proteases, other um, proteins in the human um, body? But we don't expect we're likely, or they could be easily engineered not to have these toxicities because the viral protein is different from human. I see. So when you're manufacturing uh, these protease inhibitors, is, do you think this will be easier than vaccine manufacturing? Uh, yes. Uh, expect, like to scale up the process of making a small molecule is a lot easier. And, um, and so we should be able to scale it up and make a lot of these small molecules at cheaper costs. So, you know, we, we hear a lot in the news right now about vaccines and this vaccine development. In fact, if you go to USA Today right now, they have a clock set up for where we are in determining this vaccine. Do you think that your research here uh, could be used hand in glove with the vaccine? Um, you know, is it something that would we ideally want to have both of these available? I, I think it's always good to have more approaches. But vaccines, um, you think about how a vaccine works and it prevents you from getting the disease. Uh, they don't always work. Um, they only work for particular strains, and you would like to have a treatment. When you get it, uh, what do you do then? Um, and so I think the protease inhibitors are always going to be useful. And why two of them? If we could, well, first of all, we might not be so lucky and to develop two protease inhibitors. In that case, we'll take what we can get. If we, take, we can get one inhibitor, it could be useful. But look so far, very promising that to get both proteases, both protease inhibitors, and then you give them simultaneously to the patient and it prevents resistance development. Because although one protease inhibitor um, would be good, um, it, the virus could develop mutations uh, to compensate, and then your protease inhibitor won't work. But if you give two, now the virus has to mutate and uh, get around um, both protease inhibitors, and that's almost an impossible task for any virus. Nice. So, you know, as we're, we're discussing manufacturing and creation of these drugs, you know, at what point would you bring in collaborators and in particular pharmaceutical companies on this project? Well, a lot has to do with speed. Um, where we're really good is quickly generating the inhibitor that's potent, that's drug-like. Um, we have the technology to do that better than anywhere. Um, but now to develop it, that is to run the uh, preclinical IND enabling studies and to run the actual uh, clinical trials, I think we're going to need a partner. Um, but when a company sees what we have, how quickly we can get it, we should be able to partner at that time to get approval. And I would suspect they're going to try to get fast tracking approval to get these on the market as soon as we can. Nice. So, you know, the, are there other people in the world that are going after these targets right now? And, and how are, do your efforts differentiate from, from those that you may know of elsewhere? Not only everybody is that I know, scientists 
are really trying to worldwide trying to stop the pandemic and uh, the using various um, they're not always targeting the proteases some are though and so why us what advantage do we bring to the table well as you saw from my examples with cancer we can get these inhibitors really fast and we can shortcut a lot of the time that it takes to get in a potent inhibitor that's drug-like we have a, a crew of people that are well experienced a lot of experience at doing this and um, the methodology that we particularly use is fantastic at rapidly obtaining potent inhibitors. Um, so I think that's the key to our research and why we versus someone else um, uh, will get the inhibitors. But the more the merrier, the more people we can um, that will target not only the proteases, but the en enzymes responsible for replication of the virus and uh, entry into the virus will all be useful. And when given in combination, it will stop the virus because you will not get the uh, resistance development. Like um, viruses are tricky they can mutate their way around almost anything. But two or three drugs against different targets within the virus, no, they're not gonna be able to do it. Nice. Well, the, the, maybe one or two last questions here uh, before we wrap up. I wanna be sensitive to everybody's time. Uh, this is kind of an interesting question and maybe you could just describe how uh, your lab is working uh, with COVID-19, just maybe in, in, in its system, are any of your lab techs at risk when they're dealing with these molecules? Or, or maybe how does that process of getting it into the NMR work? You know, we're all wearing face masks. <laughs> but um, there's little chance, there's no chance we're going to get the virus because um, what we're working on is a protein that resembles uh, protease is part of the virus but cannot replicate cannot do in fact is not the same so we can work on this isolated systems proteases all we want and we're not going to get COVID-19. Good good glad to hear that uh, and then maybe one last question here. Uh, several people have asked, are you in communication with some of our governmental leaders uh, about your research here, in particular Dr. Fauci or any others in the administration? Up to this point, this is the first release, public release of the results we're getting. I'm the type that doesn't like to cry wolf. When I first said, we should go after these proteases. I didn't know if we were gonna have any success. Um, and then we cloned, express, purified, labeled the proteins. That's a little bit of a success. But now we have inhibitors to both proteases. We have the assays set up. So now's the time to contact them and say, look at these preliminary results. This is very exciting. And now I feel it's the time to release the information um, that we have. Great. For sharing it with us today in your first release uh, for Vanderbilt alumni and everybody that joined us today. Uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Larry to wrap it up. Uh, just one other item of housekeeping, we did record this, um, so we will be able to share that via uh, a link with those that people who attended uh, after this, uh, for those of you that asked that question. So, Larry, I'll let you uh, close us up here. 
<clears throat> thanks, Taylor, and and thanks, Steve, for a really fantastic presentation and a really engaging question and answer period. Uh, I want to thank all of you who uh, tuned in today and and listened to this lecture. It, uh, really exciting, a very early stage, but a really advanced stage from in such a short time. So we'll look forward to, to seeing you again uh, in a future alumni event that will involve the basic sciences. In fact, uh, we have another one on the docket for August 4th, if you want to mark your calendars, and these will be uh, our group from the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery, who will tell you about some of their uh, efforts to uh, treat uh, neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. So thanks again to everybody for being here today and uh, please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye -bye.